is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Fleabag, Season 2, Episode 6. In this episode, I am just not ready to say goodbye yet. Uh, to any of it, to any one of, uh, to any of it. This was too short. <sighs> Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Karen for commissioning this episode. Hey, Karen, what's up if you're out there? So, first of all, thank you guys a lot for commissioning this series. Every now and then, I get to the end of a series that I wonder if I would ever have actually read or watched it if it weren't for the intervention of listeners and I wonder how things would have been different if I hadn't seen it because there are just some things that change you and this show no hyperbole definitely feels like I am going out of it a different person a little bit and it sounds very dramatic but I think in large part it's because I realized sort of what was going on by the end of this. And I could relate so much in so many ways. So I'm going to get there. But first, let's talk about just sheer plot. Um, this episode takes place mostly at Fleabag's father's wedding to Godmother. And yet it opens in a very intimate moment with her and the priest in bed. And it's a really, I just think there's so much attention Oh, guys, I'm just going to have to really struggle not to get so emotional that it's impossible for me to speak while I talk about this. Anytime that I come across a work that feels like somebody really put in so much care to every detail... I get this sort of awe because I will, I aim for that personally. I don't even come close to the mark, but I personally just respect that so much. And it's so rare to come across it and to not feel like you're being slapped in the face with it. And I especially love when you can look at something after and realize, oh my God, that's what was happening there. This scene opens in such a way that we should know that this isn't going to work between them. He's curled up facing away from her. And obviously... That's not like, I'm not saying if your spouse sleeps facing away from you, they hate you, secretly want a divorce. I'm talking about like the symbolism of the show. He's facing away from her. She strokes the back of his neck with her hand really lightly. And what's really interesting is that this may be one of the few... I won't say only, but one of the few cold opens we've gotten where she doesn't look at us, the audience. She doesn't break the fourth wall during this whole scene. 
She's stroking her hand down the back of his neck and she is completely in it. And she has to do it a couple times. And he has to ask her what she's thinking a couple times before he finally turns over. And she says, I can't believe you did that. And he just says, I know. And again, there's just, it feels so, there's so much foreshadowing here, you know. He doesn't say, it was worth it. He doesn't say, I can't believe I had waited so long. Like, there's no falseness or romance. It's him genuinely being like, I don't know what's happening. And it's just, there's something very raw about it. And I feel like it, it seems even more so due to the fact that she doesn't break the fourth wall. And I want to talk about that. This whole episode, she almost never does it. There's just a couple spots here and there. Like previous episodes, she was breaking the fourth wall in between every sentence, not exaggerating. Like you guys saw, she would turn and say yes, and then turn to the camera and no. Turn back, absolutely. Turn to the camera, not a chance. Like that kind of immediate rapid fire, looking, breaking, going back, looking, breaking, going back. And this episode, one of the only times that I can remember her doing it this episode is when her father says, I think you know how to love better than any of us. And that's why it's all so painful for you. And she looks at us and says, it's not painful for me. <laughs> During a moment of just supreme lack of self-awareness. And it's so clear suddenly. That's why she's doing this. She's looking at us when she's in pain. She's looking at us because she doesn't know how to cope in the moment. And this is the way that she can distance herself. So her pithy commentary and her winks to us about what's happening in that scene or the ridiculousness of this person it's all a coping mechanism for her to keep people, not even people, because we're not real to her. We're, like I said, a mechanism to keep herself at arm's length from whatever it is that she is experiencing in that scene. And as somebody who doesn't do well, with confronting my emotions or being vulnerable in the moment and always feels this like perverse need to make a joke during moments of vulnerability. Uh, I really a little bit too hard that when I suddenly realized like that's what was happening was she is feeling so acutely that she's pushing us between her and the thing. It just made everything a little less funny <laughs> in retrospect and it's still funny but it's this compounded pain and fear that are riding along with all of it the whole time and it makes sense how as this series has progressed she has spent less time with us and the moments that we are actually having with her are being interrupted by the priest going, whoa, hey, what was that? Where are you going? Because he is drawing her back into herself, despite herself. She, like the feelings that she's having toward him and the fact that she's been taking better care of herself mean that she is opening up in a way that she hasn't in probably a while or ever 
I get the impression, ever. Maybe before her mom died, perhaps. And so when he is kind of calling her out for vanishing into this headspace for a second, it's her being basically being told, you can't do that now. If they really are like connecting with you, if you really care about this person, they're going to see it and you aren't going to be able to escape it because that's the point. When you really give a fuck, you don't get the option and you don't want the option because it matters too much to be willing to do that anymore. Y'all, it's too much. So I should have known, like I said, when this episode started the way that it did, that things weren't going to work out between the two of them. And what I really love about this finale is the fact that the fact that it doesn't work out between the two of them doesn't like kill me that much. Of course, a part of you wants it to work out between them because you want her to be happy. If you're not a religious person, you don't, necessarily understand what it is that he's doing and why, what he gets out of it and why he's sacrificing. So I think that for me is what's so difficult. It's not that I don't believe in his faith because any conversation between the two of them, it's obvious that his faith is genuine. He means it. But for me, being faithful and being a priest are not mutually exclusive ideas. So he could continue in his faith, just not as a priest anymore, and potentially be actually happy with her. So his decision to not pursue things because he feels called to God, while perfectly valid, it just feels alien. I don't understand it, you know? And that's fine. I don't need to understand it all. <laughs> you know, I really don't. Um, but she, uh, I'm getting, I'm getting like turned around in circles because I'm trying not to talk about the one thing, but I desperately want to talk about it. So I'm going to back up. We have to go to the wedding, unfortunately. This wedding, we've got Claire and Fleabag, and they're greeting everybody as they come into the backyard. It's backyard wedding. It actually looks very lovely. And Claire has put a clip in ponytail to hide the fact that she cut all her hair off. And the, <laughs> this whole like, interaction between everybody coming in and the two of them it like ranges from so awkward to so it, it's almost like this false casualness there's just a lot for me of physical comedy in this bit and I really loved like having some characters like her ex-boyfriend shows up again with uh, his girlfriend. I don't remember her wife because she was pregnant and had a kid. But I don't know if they got married. Um, so <laughs> I love Jake coming up to her and asking where's Claire when Claire is literally a foot away from her. <laughs> and eventually we have the intros of all of the godmothers, very interesting friends. I, guys, what do you call this? Because what she's doing, and we've known this, but we never had such a series of examples in a row as we do this episode. She collects people because she wants to be able to say she has one of that variety. It's like Pokemon, right? So I have a lesbian friend. I have a deaf friend. I have a friend who's, what was he, Israeli? I, like, Kuwaiti? 
she just wants people that and she keeps introducing them as my very interesting friend blank 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 and i want to like my impulse is to say that if you do something like this it's because you yourself aren't interesting and you're trying to surround yourself with interesting people in order to fool everyone else into thinking you also are interesting maybe the fact that she is a visual artist and had this successful gallery opening, you know, earlier, or no, finale of last season, I think it was. She is fairly interesting on the surface, not as a person, granted. But maybe that's what it is. Maybe, I don't know, I want to say maybe the art is like a put on because she's trying to be like manufacture an, a personality. But I don't know. It seems like she's genuinely good at it. And I can't tell. I really just don't know what this is about for her, except this sort of status thing, wanting a circle that, like I said, has one of everyone. I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. And it's like, I feel like I have seen this kind of person before, not this exact behavior, but I understand what's going on in a general sense. But when I try and pinpoint a reason behind this kind of behavior, I just don't really understand what it could be driven by. So anyway, I just I found it so funny her talking about the things. So Fleabag is talking to Claire about Claire. And she says something about how he is crazy about her, which is, of course, a nightmare and doesn't want to talk about it any further. And this is one of the few moments like Fleabag doesn't say anything. She just looks at the camera. Again, it's a lot of that. She doesn't do the kind of interacting that she was doing before. And even in this moment, with her godmother introducing people and it being very sort of ripe, uh, fertile ground for commentary. She barely does it. The only time is to like chime in with she's a lesbian before her godmother says she's a lesbian. Just just the one. Um, and then she's trying to introduce her husband to be and she can't remember his name. You guys, I nearly died. I thought this was just such a golden moment. And it's a combo, of course, because he isn't he doesn't have like a name in the credits, right? But also, or she is so wrapped up in herself at this moment. Guys, can I tell you something? <laughs> On my wedding day to Brendan, it was the first time that my mother would see my father in, God, at that point, maybe like eight years. And she was a wreck over it. I don't know how he felt about it because he just hid everything. But she was just a wreck. And she was coming with her husband. And my father was coming with his new wife. And my mom was so consumed with anxiety over seeing my father again, that when she introduced her husband, she called him by my father's name by accident. <laughs> I think she was introducing him to Brendan's parents. And she said, this is Eduardo. Oh, my God. Jim. And guys, she did it twice. Two different times. And I swear to God, I understand why. Jim was very understanding. But I, in his shoes, I don't know what I would have thought. I really don't. I feel like I, I, I would have wanted to kill him. I just... Oh, God, this just really reminded me of that so much. So at this point, uh, Fleabag pulls out a gift and she says, I've been trying to get rid of it for ages. And her godmother says, I'm going to go open it by a bin so I've got somewhere to put the paper, but come with me. And she goes along and basically... As she's opening the package, her godmother says, 
I just wondered if you had a little show planned. You normally do. I was wondering if there was anything I might need to know about what might happen later. Oh. Oh, I hate her so much. It's very gratifying later when Claire tells the truth about the miscarriage. It was very gratifying, everybody. Oh, God damn. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me know if you change your mind, because today is the most important day of my life. And I love your father very much. And I imagine you'd rather have me looking after him in the years to come than having to do it yourself. So no more miscarriages. I just, God, I want to drown her. Uh, so she opens the box and there is the statue that Fleabag stole from her. Now, again, with major moments this episode of Fleabag's moving forward, this may seem on the surface simply to be a petty thing. And don't get me wrong, it is that also. I am in respect of the petty, especially dealing with cunts like this. Amen. Hallelujah. However, what this really is for me, they have been having this passive aggressive back and forth with the statue with her knowing perfectly well, Fleabag stole it and Fleabag denying it and taking it back. Yada, yada, yada. I love that. She just decides to fucking own it here and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I stole it. I, I took it from your house. I walked out with it and lied to your face many times, actually. So uh, here it is back. I did that. You know, I did that. I know, you know, I did that. And that's that. It's just a directness that we haven't really seen between the two of them at all. And despite the fact that she steals it back later, in, in its way, that's still because she, she put it out on the table here, literally and figuratively, and is sort of taking it back is just her being like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I know for sure that you are aware who did it this time and I'm still doing it. Like, yeah, absolutely. Um, so <laughs> she looks like she wants to hit her with it for a second when she opens the box and she reaches forward and touches the side of Fleabag's face and says, thank you. But it really, for a moment, it looks like she is going to get her head caved in on one side by a titty. I'll go and put her straight back on her shelf. And then she says, I often thought it was strange that of all my pieces, you chose to take her. She was based on your mother. And it's very clear she is saying this to get to her because being given this as a gift, it got to her. So she's just trying to win this little moment. And unfortunately, for this moment, she does win. She doesn't win entirely because I think Fleabag taking it back says it all. But in this instance, in the instant that she said it and the reaction that she got out of Fleabag, I think she won. But Fleabag looks at the camera in that second and there's a determination there. And I shouldn't have been surprised to see that she stole that shit back. Because, I mean, this woman has been nothing but trying to take her mother's place this whole time. Genuinely, like the whole thing with, oh, I'm not trying to take your parents' place tends to be true for most people. They don't want to take a place. They want to be their own person. But she wants to pretend Fleabag's mother never existed, to be honest. So, yeah, she is actually trying to take her place in so much as one can. So after this moment and being very agitated by it, she goes to smoke a cigarette. And when she goes around the corner, the priest is there and he jumps. I love him saying, I thought you were a fox. <laughs> um, so he says that he's practicing and it's not going very well. He's really worried and it feels like <laughs> this moment 
he doesn't know what to say because he has to talk about love and he's uh, kind of freaking out and having a crisis of faith. I would like to point out to everybody. I didn't notice it until just now because I have the episode playing while I record. He has got some red lipstick like all over the top of his upper lip in this scene. It's very clear they already kissed in one take and then went back. Um, and also her lipstick is very smudged as she comes around the corner also. So yeah, that's <laughs> clearly this has happened already one time. Um, also, there's a little bit of red lipstick on her neck. I think that maybe he like wiped it off his face with his hand and then touched her neck and got some down the side of her neck. Um, but yeah, this, th there's a little bit of a hint here. I didn't notice it at all the first time though. It doesn't take anything away from the scene. Uh, <laughs> and also you can see that she's sort of red in the nose and chin area, right where the rubbing happens. So her makeup got smudged off. Yeah. There's all the kissing evidence. I didn't even see it. So he says that he better go and he begins to walk by her and then just like a attacks her and is kissing her up against the wall. And it's a super passionate moment. The two of them have such insane chemistry. It's truly like just, Oh, and this is when she tells him to stop because he has lipstick all over him. And he's like, Oh my God. And he leans up against her and keeps saying, I don't know. I don't know what this feeling is. And she says, is it God or is it me? And he says, I don't know. I don't know. And he walks away. And it's just so difficult, guys, watching it. Because, and I mean that outside of knowing what actually happens and what he decides, in this moment, they have such chemistry. And he walks away and just is, there's one of those moments of him looking at her like, I, I, I'm, I feel like I was starving to death and you're a meal right here and everything I wanted. And it's too good to be true. And it's also awful. And he, as he walks away, he stops and gives her one last look. And there is such sort of desperation in it. It's like loving and affectionate and happy, but there's also this like plea and it's a lot. Um, and you see when she sort of turns back and leans against the wall again, she has a, a worried expression because it wasn't pure happiness and she can see it. She can tell it's not over, you know, like the, she hasn't won. So here comes Claire with a drink talking about how I hate my husband and the man I love is on his way to Finland. So pretty weird. And I can't get over the fact that she just says it. The man I love is on his way to Finland. Like we knew, right? We knew. And we knew the flea bag knew. But she just said it. Things progress very quickly for Claire in this episode. And it's extremely relatable to me personally. Like, I don't know if you guys get like this, but I will hold out on really letting myself think a thing for such a long time. And then once I begin to let the thought in, it's like a fucking freight train and it suddenly becomes a truth. And by the end of the day, I'm acting like I always knew this was true, even though I was in such denial, you know. So they are circled up. Her, Claire, Martin, Godmother, Priest, Jake. I think her father is there. Oh, my very interesting friend, Lucy, who is a surrogate. Um, I love that Martin just says weird off to the side. <laughs> Excuse me. Just the, the just the reaction she wanted, to be honest. She wants somebody to just go, wow, weird. Um, and then, and you, of course, remember her, this one, who's had a miscarriage. I swear to God, I want to rip her face off. I want to rip it off. And I want to shove it in her mouth and then staple her mouth shut. <sighs> but you knew that you were there. And Claire interrupts with, it was my miscarriage. And everybody's laughing like they think she's joking. 
And she says it again, and they all keep laughing. And then she finally says to Martin, yes, I thought you'd find that funny. And she points to Fleabag and says, she was just covering for me. And you see the moment where Godmother realizes and looks at Fleabag like she, like in just such horror, which she should anyway, just because her behavior is abhorrent either way. But nevertheless, and Martin says we were pregnant and she says for a few weeks, yes. <sighs> what the fuck is going on here? It was my baby? I guess it was your baby's way of saying it didn't want you as its father, like a goldfish out the bowl sort of thing. <sighs> Oh, that is some good shit, Claire. Oh, beauty. Oh, goddess. Thank you. And Godmother says, whoever had the miscarriage, can you take it inside? And she just looks at Martin and says, this is over and stalks away. I was interested to watch that Jake doesn't have much of a reaction beyond shock. And we know that he told Fleabag to get her to leave his dad. So this is what he wanted. But I wasn't sure that he would feel that way when the time came. And it seems like he's just stepping back and letting it happen. But I didn't know, you know. So they all go inside. And Claire, interestingly to me, she says to Martin, you're leaving me. And... I was fascinated by this turn of phrase because it's usually I'm leaving you. Why do you think she says you're leaving me? Because I feel like it's meant to be, I am going to keep the house. You're the one who has to actively do the leaving. But I don't know if it's that simple. I feel like m there might be a sort of like psychological aspect to it that I'm not seeing. But it's just interesting to me that it's not, I'm leaving you, which is what most people say because they want to take like ownership of their actions and take control. So phrasing it as an active sentence they are doing and completing achieves that sort of feeling. You are leaving me. It feels so much more like... That's what happens to the loser, right? That's what we say, like, so-and-so left him. So-and-so left her. That's meant to indicate they were abandoned by a person who no longer loved them. Right? And so for her to suggest it in this way, I found surprising because it's sort of trying, it's, it's like almost an admission that she can't do it. That she she isn't able to do the leaving that it has to be him and i don't know and it's sort of followed up by this conversation that they have where <laughs> it sort of feels like he thinks that's the case as well that she can't do it and it, he is trying to call her bluff here so he's <laughs> He has a little speech. This is another one of the few asides that Fleabag makes this episode. Um, I know you look at me and you see a bad man with a big beard. And she interrupts with, you're an alcoholic and you tried it on with my sister. Fine. I tried to kiss your sister on her birthday. My birthday. Fine. I mix up birthdays. I have an alcohol problem like everyone else in this fucking country. But I am here and I do things. I pick up Jake from shit. I make dessert for Easter. I organize the downstairs toilet. I fired the humming cleaner. I hoover the car. I put up all your certificates and I don't make you feel guilty for not having sex with me. I am not a bad guy. I just have a bad personality. It's not my fault. Some people are born with fucked personalities. Look at Jake. He is so creepy. It's not his fault. Why the bassoon? You want to know what the bassoon is? It's a cry for help. <sighs> 
And then the main problem I hear, I see here is that you don't like me. And I think that's been breaking my fucking heart for 11 years. I love you. I make you laugh. I'm a douche, but I make you laugh. You said that was the most important thing. And I think the thing that you hate most about yourself is that you love me. That you actually love me. And she gets this expression on her face that feels like he 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 got a bullseye there. It doesn't I want to not give him any victories in this little fucking exchange, but I can't do that. That one landed. Doesn't change anything is the thing. But mm. and he says I am not going to leave you until you are down on your knees and begging me. And he says it with this smile on his face. Like he really is confident. It's not a bright, it's not a bright, big smile. It's this little like smirk of amusement. Like he's just found the fucking loophole. And she puts, she, she gets down on her knees very deliberately and says, please leave me. And she says it and then sort of looks off to the side, like Jesus, like you really made me. Uh, okay idiot and he just says i didn't think you'd do it in that dress and then right well i guess the only thing left for me to say is and he turns to fleabag and says fuck you that's the thing he hates competing with her for his wife's affection and so the last thing he has to say after his marriage ends isn't even to his wife. It's not even like, that's not even it, you know? Oof. I was so happy, y'all, because I can't have been alone in worrying that she might not leave him after all. It's hard to know sometimes how a show wants to sign off. You can have the happy ending that is cathartic and what you really hoped for because this is not real and we can choose the ending we'd like. Or we can have a very human and real moment of her attempting a divorce and not actually being able to stand by it up until the, the last moments. That is not uncommon. A lot of people take multiple tries to get divorced or just break up. You know, it's like you got to get the rocking motion going before you're able to finally get the leverage to get out of it. So Gabriella says, uh, the moment she kneels is so powerful for me. It's usually a humbling, pathetic position. But here is Claire asking for what she wants. And I love it. Agreed. Agreed. And it was just such a relief. I wanted her to leave this asshole so bad, you know, and it is so exciting for me to watch her call him out completely and watch him do this thing, which, oh man, <sighs> the dude listing shit he does, if that isn't the most classic thing, like, it is really astonishing when you start seeing how certain men keep score and catalog all the ways that they have helped. Because as women, most of us are trained to be the caretaker of the home, to be the domestic, right? So we do everything and lose track of all the things we do without even thinking about it throughout the day, you know? Well, I just, you know, I picked up some things from the living room and put them away. I just, I straightened the bed. I just, you know, I like kind of made the bed. I refilled the dishwasher, emptied the dishwasher from yesterday. It's not a big deal. I just sort of cleared the fridge out. There was a lot of old stuff in there. So I just, I cleared it out. I took the garbage out. So the, I mean, you know, I just vacuumed. It was not, I just folded some laundry. And meanwhile, let a man vacuum once 
And he will bring it up for six years that he does laundry sometimes. He'll say sometimes. Like it wasn't the one time that he did it on his own. And then there were like two times where he helped you do it. But then he's just got credit for sometimes doing laundry. All of a sudden that becomes the thing that he puts on his resume. It honestly is. It's like padding a resume. You do shit one time and then you list that as a skill. Like you just know how to. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Nobody's fooled. But yeah, this just that really got to me. And, and I picked Jake up from shit. You're his father. You don't get credit for that. What do you think? What? A congratulations? Like, I do things. I wipe my own ass. <clears throat> I shower. Like, guy, raise the bar a tiny bit. Jesus Christ. So, then we have the moment of the actual... Oh my God, guys, I keep forgetting to talk about the portrait that their godmother did of, of Claire and Fleabag. Fleabag with her back to the viewer and Claire with her mouth all pinched up in irritation. God, it is so good. But we've got everybody preparing for the ceremony and her father is missing. And godmother says, can you do something? Please, please, please. And I love this moment of power. They both, Claire and Fleabag, look at each other as she's asking for help. In a, in a sort of moment of like, oh, God. Oh, he might have just done a fucking bunk. Maybe we should just like pretend to look for him. And they sort of see her get a bit more desperate with each please. And finally, they're like, oh, okay, 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 okay. So she goes upstairs and finds the attic door open. And this, the like, you know, little uh, ladder is down. And when she goes upstairs, she misunderstands what she's saying. And he says, I can't get out. And she says, okay, dad, you can. I can't. It's a trap. I'm stuck. No, dad, just, there's nothing I can do. Everyone will understand. Just give them all a bottle. Honestly, they'll, they'll be relieved. And then he says, my foot is stuck. Ah, guys, I mean, I knew what it was. Like, I, I didn't think that it was a mouse trap, but I was certain that he had gotten stuck somehow, like actually, literally. But yeah, I love this moment when he says everyone will understand. And it's not even like he's that puzzled because he says to her later, I know your godmother isn't everyone's cup of tea. But I do enjoy the bit here of him just being like, what did you mean? Pray tell. He's just, you know, he's got to. So... She asks him what the fuck he is even doing up in the attic to begin with. And he says that he was thinking about how there was a trap up here and that maybe there was a mouse that had that because he hadn't checked it. And he was like, maybe it was up here suffocating. And it's symbolism, obviously. He is concerned that maybe he's making a mistake. And he's not going to back out of this, though, you know. Because she really tries to push him to answer her honestly. And he just, he says, I was checking on the mouse. Again, with this like expression of sort of over innocence. And she asks him, do you want to make a run for it? I can smuggle you out in one of mom's dresses. No, I know she's not everyone's cup of tea. But that's just it. And he says, but neither are you, darling. I mean, I'm sorry. I love you. But I'm not sure that I like you all the time. Sorry. And she says, you created this monster. And he says, you're not the way you are because of me. You are, you're the way you are because of her. And those 
bits are the ones you need to cling to. Which is truly like, I just loved this moment because he has talked before about his wife, that he loved her, but she was sometimes really difficult. He didn't like her all the time. And it's interesting to hear somebody say they felt that way about, first of all, their own wife, second of all, their own daughter, but third of all, that they felt that way and they know it's valuable anyway. You know, and I think that that's something we can grow to see. A lot of us that there will be people that like, I don't like them, but I think that they have like a reason for being. It's not that there are people who are, you know, you don't like and you're genuinely like, what does this person bring to the universe? Like, why? What good have they done anyone? But there are people that you can see. Oh, yeah, okay. Like, I get it. They're not somebody that I'm super into or that I see eye to eye on all the time. And sometimes those people will be your friends. That's always really interesting. I have had that a couple times in my life. Somebody that I'm friends with, but I don't even know that I like them. I just find them compelling somehow, you know? And I can't imagine marrying someone like that, but he's marrying godmother. So clearly difficult women who are a lot are his thing. You know, like it just, it sounds like that's a thing for him. Um, and she seems really touched by this moment, by him saying, like, I don't like you all the time. But that doesn't mean that you're not wonderful all the time. Those aren't, you know, those aren't mutually exclusive. And he says, I want my daughters to be proud of me. And she says, you have two daughters who love you, even if you don't like them. And he says, I like Claire. And she just says, Jesus, dad. But when she looks at him, he really laughs in this genuine moment of like, I know, I know, I probably went too far, but it's you and I'm confident I didn't actually go too far. You know, there's just something about this moment between the two of them and how they haven't been able to have like a fucking open conversation without interruption for fucking two seasons and they finally get it. You know, I really thought Godmother was going to burst in at any second, but she doesn't. They have this whole thing. And she puts her hand on and she says, come on, Dad. And he says, I don't think I can go. And she says, come on, buck up. Off we go. And he takes her hand. And this is when he says, I think you know how to love better than any of us. That's why you find it all so painful. And she stands stock still for a second. And then looks at the camera and says, I don't find it painful. Just in this beautiful moment of trying to undermine the entire point of the entire show. Sweetie. (laughs) You do, though. So he leans on her deeply. All the way down the aisle. And when she's beginning to walk away, he continues to cling to her hand in a way that makes her godmother obviously very uncomfortable. He barely is able to let go. And this is when we get the speech. So (laughs) Jake asks to play another piece on his bassoon that leads to time for a conversation with Claire where Fleabag suggests that Claire go to the airport in order to track down Claire. You go and get him. She says, I can't go and get him. It's too late. He's at the airport. I can't leave my father's wedding. I don't even know what terminal he he's in. I, uh, 
I can't go through security without a boarding pass. I'd have to buy a dummy ticket just to get through the gate. I don't know when his flight is or which terminal. Imagine if I knew that. Imagine him finding out that I knew that. All of this incredibly practical thinking. Complete. I love her so much. And Fleabag says, okay, that would be intense. And then Claire says, the only person I'd run through an airport for is you. And she turns and looks at her. It's the first, like, real I love you from Claire. That's, that's I love you. That is, like, that's everything. When somebody says that shit to you, that's what counts, that shit. You can say I love you all day long. It doesn't mean anything, not really. People act like the words are so heavy. Like, no, they, they mean a lot. But how you show it is the thing. That's it. And I just thought this was the sweet. It just really got me when she says that. I stopped for a second. and was like, oh, my God. It's just so sweet. Um, and guys, I'm going to put forth a theory here. They have this conversation during Jake's bassoon solo. And he gives, I think, Claire a look when he finishes and begins to put it away. And I am going to go ahead and like make a headcanon here that he requested like some time because he knew that she like wanted to bail and he wanted to like, I'm going to, I'm going to make it that Jake is a little bit more savvy than any of us have given him credit for this whole time. And that this isn't just an awkwardness of him being like, I want this to be about me. I really want to pretend that he was like, I want to give Claire time to run to the airport. Not like that specific, but you know, I just, I don't know. I mean, Martin's not here anymore. So it's not like he needed to, she could go at any time. But nevertheless, so (sighs) this is the speech and I'm just going to read it. Um, He gets very choked up and it turns out it's quite hard to come up with something original to say about love, but I've had a go. And he looks at Fleabag here. And she gets this breathless sort of quality and you see him look like he might cry. And he says, love is awful. It's painful. It's frightening. Makes you doubt yourself, judge yourself, distance yourself from the other people in your life. Makes you selfish, makes you creepy, makes you obsessed with your hair, makes you cruel makes you say and do things you never thought you would do. It's all any of us want, and it's hell when we get there. So no wonder it's something we don't want to do on our own. I was taught if we're born with love, then life is about choosing the right place to put it. People talk about that a lot, about it feeling right. When it feels right, it's easy, but I'm not sure that's true. It takes strength to know what's right. And that he looks at her and there's a real sense to her of knowing exactly what he means. She just knows. And there's an apology all over his face. He's not, you know, trying to look desperately heartbroken in the midst of giving a speech for somebody's wedding. But it's clear. And love isn't something that weak people do. Being a romantic takes a hell of a lot of hope. And I think what they mean is when you find somebody that you love, it feels like hope. And it's just really what a speech. And Claire is sitting there looking like she may burst into tears at any moment. 
And Fleabag just says, go out the side way now. And she's crying and looks over to her and yanks the godforsaken ponytail out of her hair and slaps it on the chair. I love that because it feels like a reference to Antony saying, if you want to change your life, change your life. It's not going to happen in here. You know, it feels like her being like, well, fucking okay. Challenge accepted. Because, oh no, Martin is still there. Martin is still there, guys. I thought he was gone. I, I was so wrapped up in this moment, I didn't see it. Because the camera, and after she gets up and walks away, we see her drop her hair, cut to flea bag. Camera turns to Jake as he's watching her leave. And there is a satisfaction, I do not think I'm reading into that, to his expression as he watches her leave. And Martin looking very sad and curious, but not stopping her. So I 100% stand by my Jake theory. I just do. I feel like that was, I, I feel like he knew. I just do. So take words from this book of love. Be strong and take heart. And all who hope in the Lord. And yeah, with that ending, you just, there it is. So let's get on with the big bit. And we cut to the after when she is outside having a cigarette and chatting with her dad, gives him the cigarette to which he initially declines and then says, oh, fuck it. And goes up to her and says, thank you. Uh, and then the priest is looking for you. So she goes to the back. She says goodbye to everybody and <laughs> goes and waits at the bus stop and he comes and sits with her. Guys, there is nothing as painful as in this rewatch, the moment when there's like this moment when she's just looking around wondering if she's going to spot him. And then the moment that she does spot him and the way that she lights up, ugh, kill me. Like, cause yeah, she just lights up and he sits down next to her as they're looking at 46 minutes until the next bus, which winds up being canceled later. And there's this awkward pause and he makes small talk about the wedding and her sister and it's just talking around the whole thing. And eventually she just says, it's God, isn't it? And he says, yeah, it is. And everybody's heart broke at the same time. I mean, their hearts are breaking. Oh, God. And here's the thing, guys. She looks away and says, damn. And again, no asides, no looking at the camera, no winking, nothing. She is engaged to this moment for real. And she says, you know, the thing is, that I fucking love you. And he starts to answer. And she says, no, no, don't. Let's just leave that out there just for a second on its own. I love you. And you guys, again, that's the opposite of what the whole show has been. Nothing has just been left out there on its own. Everything has come with an aside, with commentary, with a wink, a nudge, as they say, a wink and a nudge. All of it has felt like we are watching something happening. And 
it's being pointed out to us continually. Oh, look at this thing you're seeing happen here. Isn't that interesting? And in this last moment where she's actually genuinely vulnerable with someone, none of that needs to be there. She doesn't have to cope. There's no crutch. She is just living it. And it's not even like there's a hint that she wants to look at the camera and then pulls back into her. Like, we aren't there to her right now, you know? And there's a long pause as he looks at her and says, it'll pass. And maybe, you know, I mean, a lot of us have been in love more than once. So when you say it'll pass, it sounds so false. But it's probably true. It's just when you actually are in the middle of it, God, that doesn't sound true at all. And he finally gets up and walks off. And as he's leaving, he says, see you Sunday. I'm joking. You're never allowed in my church again. And I give a, a one last, I love you too. And he's crying. Just so that we know, oh yeah, it's killing him. <laughs> you know, this isn't him like walking away because she had stronger feelings than he did. No, it's just that his devotion lies somewhere already. And again, she's just sitting there like crying. No looking at the camera, no acknowledgement, nothing. Until she sees that the bus is canceled and it sort of, it's like it causes her to step back for a second and she sees the fox. And uh, it's such a weird thing. I'm assuming that this is a CGI fox. But she says he went that way and watches it follow him in this moment of just what a, uh, an enjoyable, weird, ongoing joke this bit is. I really like it. And this is when she pulls out the statue of her mother that she took back and holds it tight. And again, it's just this like one last moment where she looks at the camera with a bit of a smile, but it's not a mischievous. Do you see what I did here? It's a, I know I, I couldn't help it. It's a genuine connection of emotion, not comedy distancing her from emotion. So she gets up and she starts to walk away and the camera begins to follow her and she stops and just gives a little shake of her head. And then she walks probably half a block and we just watch her from afar as she walks away and she turns and gives us one last sorry bye and it's her not needing us anymore because she finally somehow like broke through and realized that there was a place that she could be genuine again I don't know. Maybe it was when her friend died, but it feels like she wasn't doing super well before that either because she wouldn't have slept with that guy if she was in a great place. So this moment feels like a, a major breakthrough and her hope. That's the thing with the priest, even though it doesn't end together he gave her a gift anyway and made her realize that it was possible to feel like that. And that can be all it takes, you know, that knowledge. Oh, that that's out there. I didn't think that was for me. I didn't think it was real, but it it's out there and it didn't work out this time, 
but I got a little taste of it and holy shit, you know? Ugh, you guys, what a good ending. I swear to God, I had no idea where they were going to take it. I really didn't. And I didn't understand the point of us until that moment when she says, no, don't follow me. And I was suddenly like, oh, like I kind of got it at the end of the last episode when she smacks the camera down, when it's watching her having sex with the priest and she's just not going to play that way right now. But I thought that was going to be a one-time acknowledgement. I didn't realize we were going to be like, oh no, that's what it's all been. This whole thing. And wow, just really something. What beautiful work. Owen has only watched the first episode and that was like over a year ago now. So I'm going to be rewatching it with him and I can't wait. I really can't. Uh, this show could have gone on, but it wouldn't, it, it, it shouldn't. I want it to be longer, but I don't want it to change at all. Does that make sense? So that happens. Um, yeah. So thank you guys all again so much for commissioning this. I, what a gift it really was. And thank you to Karen for commissioning this episode specifically. I love you all so much. This was good shit. <sighs> Until the next emotionally devastating series. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.